Hello, everybody. Welcome in. Happy Saturday. Talking from the graveyard of microphones. I'm trying a new one today, number 18, so let me know if you guys can hear me loud and clear. Yeah, it's the bane of my existence. Anyway, jumping ahead. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff today. We'll make it fast. I'm a bit later than normal. You know, Saturdays are supposed to be about, uh, you know, a quick condensed news segment, but there's just simply so much to share, so much you all need to know. It has to be a long one, so we'll try squeeze it into 20 minutes. We'll talk about Max Payne options, the Ethereum price action, uh, Cardano, a little bit about Bitcoin, crypto adoption around the world, which countries are most hungry for it, and the world crisis that's emerging all over the place, all at once, and what it means for the rest of us, whether you are an emerging market or in a Western nation. It's not good for anybody. So let's jump in. First of all, the big story today is Ethereum. The price is on fire, and everybody is excited about the merge, which now has a date. That's the merge to proof of stake, and that is scheduled for September 19th. Now, although it says the price jumped 12%, it's actually a lot higher than that. Now, the Ethereum mainnet is a big deal, moving to proof of stake, and it uh, has a lot of people excited and will bring about a lot of positive price action. So let's talk about... Ethereum, it is up 33% in four days. Now, there's a couple of things I want to point out in this chart. Uh, a few interesting things. We did talk about the Pi cycle bottom for Bitcoin five days ago, four days ago. I don't even remember. But Ethereum had one as well exactly four days ago. And since it hit that Pi cycle bottom, and I don't know if it's relevant, if it's just a Bitcoin only thing, but it worked pretty well for, for Ethereum. And again, that 33% move in just four days is quite, pretty astounding. We also smashed through the 50-day moving average, which is kind of like that thin blue line that is hidden by behind the flag from the Pi cycle bottom. And that's the first time the Ethereum price has been above the 50-day moving average since April 23rd. Now, the 200-day moving average remains about $2,500. And remember that number, 33%, because we'll be talking about that number again Finding patterns and numbers, fun thing to do. Uh, next thing, what also had this huge squeeze, especially over the last 24 hours, is according to CoinGlass, uh, there was $150 million in liquidated ETH positions. So a lot of people were hoping for Ethereum to fall under 1000 bucks, And the largest single liquidation order, I think, was on FTX. It was about $3 million somebody lost, needless to say. Probably not a good idea to go short Ethereum in this market, especially with the proof of stake news coming. Now let's look at some options action and where we are out to September because it's important to think about where the bets are being placed based on us now having this date of the merge of September 19th. So I picked the date September 30th for the options information. Now, peculiarly enough, the max pain price is at $1,500. But look at that put call ratio, 0 0.2. That is insane. It's basically four times, five times the number of people are buying call options over put options. And that is quite impressive. Also, there are lots of bets at $3,500, $4,000 Ethereum, and $5,000 Ethereum by September. Of course, this doesn't mean anything. We don't know exactly what's going to happen, but it is interesting to see that complete lack of bearishness for Ethereum. So that tells me maybe it will be number go up time for Ethereum, and it's been smashed hard compared to many other things. Let's talk about Bitcoin while we're on the topic of options. This is Bitcoin July 29th option action, and you can see the max paying price is about 23500 which is not a lot. But again, some big bets going in there at around 30,000. And we'll see what happens. And you can see the put-call ratio is 0 0.82. So it's almost like parity. So people are both bearish and bullish on Bitcoin. Bullishness has the slight edge, of course, but not that much, not that much to get too excited about <laughs> through the end of the month, despite the fact we are looking pretty strong today. I think Bitcoin is just above over $21,500. 21, 21,000. 260 bucks exactly and ethereum hit 1400 earlier massive spike now it's back down around 1350 so good day all around and another one we thought we'd have a look at as well 
thinking about September, and September could be a very good month for crypto. It could also be the time that the Fed pivots. I know a lot of people are talking about a 100 basis point hike in about a week or two, but I don't see that happening. 75, yes, 100 basis points. It just puts the country under too much pressure, and I'll talk about that towards the end of this video as to why. But here you see the max paying price for Solana is 42, and the price of Solana just hit 40 an hour or so ago. So lots of bets as well, if we look here at the $70 area, that big green line, but also people buying puts at 34 bucks. So overall, September looks good, but we'll see where this goes. It'll be interesting to revisit these. Now, speaking of Cardano, there was a great uh, article in Finbold where the consensus of 53 cryptocurrency and Web3 industry professionals predicts the price of Cardano will trade at 63 cents by the year end 2022. And they had uh, forecasted about $3 at the, there was a prediction in January. So it's come down an awful lot from nearly three bucks to 63 cents. But that is still a 33% upside from today's prices. So again, 33% is back, like with what Ethereum's done over the last four days. And this is their chart that they shared as well from finders, from their top 53 experts. Now, it's interesting as well. They had a target price of uh, for Cardano at year-end 2030 of about $58. And now they've reduced that down to about $6.54, which is, again, a nearly a 90% haircut on the price. So I don't know how they come up with these numbers. I don't know what their scientific methods are. But to radically change them in the space of six months is very astonishing. So I don't know what they see that others don't, but we'll watch this space carefully. Now let's talk about oil for a second. All eyes are on oil as it's hovering just under $100, which is a key level. As you know, oil is a key driver of inflation. Let's look at the oil chart real fast because it's important for it to stay under 100 bucks. First of all, the February 24th invasion date price was 92 bucks. We're currently trading about 96, 98 dollars. And I put in a blue line there showing the $100 level. And again, it's mean reverting like everything else. It has taken another run at 100 bucks. It might breach it, might go to 110 for a few days. But the overall trajectory should be down, especially towards middle, end of August as we go forward. So let's talk about what JP Morgan think about oil. This uh, raised a lot of eyebrows all over the world when JP Morgan predicted $380 oil on their worst case Russian cut, and that is stratospheric, uh, $380 a barrel. And <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking or what they were smoking, but that was uh, a bit silly. Uh, that's not going to happen because that would just <laughs> destroy the whole business. But they do have some interesting Bitcoin predictions. One, uh, they did predict a little while ago that Bitcoin could hit 146,000, and it's acting more like digital gold than ever, so kudos to the team that did that. And they also said uh, recently as well that the fair value for Bitcoin is 38,000 based on their long-term theoretical target for Bitcoin. So they are somewhat positive too about Bitcoin. Now let's talk about Bitcoin as well and crypto and Latin America. So Latin America are the most bullish on crypto. Two thirds, 66, 67%, I think it was, said they are more likely tr to transact with entities that accept crypto payments, while 50% believe it'll have a massive impact on finance and society. And citizens of the Middle Eastern nations responded as well. Similarly, 67% would also like to transact with digital payment methods. Um, obviously, the way they have to pay in certain countries is very archaic right now, and it's a big problem. What was also interesting as well, only, I think the Europeans, only 35% believe that digital assets would positively affect the future of the monetary network, while 40% would transact with crypto payments. So that was bullish, but why? Why is Latin America so interested in crypto? Well, <laughs> sometimes you see that uh, the more problems a certain country has, for example, Argentina, the more they need a harder asset. So speaking of inflation, which drives that, uh, Argentinians face the prospect of 90% inflation by year end. Now, this is all related as well to global contagion ramping up. Uh, a big thank you as well to Dr. Imrani for bringing this to my attention. 
And this was a post by Alex Gladstein on Twitter. And uh, it was also talking about a Wall Street Journal article about collapsing economies and IMF bailouts, how they are not working or they've caused problems. Places like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Ghana, Ecuador, Tunisia, Sudan, Lebanon, Uganda, and beyond, Argentina, etc. And the cycle of suffering is inherent to the fiat international monetary system. Bitcoin is the way out. I used to say last year, all roads lead to Bitcoin. But the way the IMF and ESG woke initiatives uh, have really helped spin these countries into a complete catastrophe. And uh, it's really bad and it's getting worse. But let's look at all the countries on the danger zone list. And then I'll show you ones that are way worse. So first of all, this from Daniel Beza. And this is not a good list to be on. But remember, it's not also because there's a few countries I found that should be on the list and they're not. Now, a few things uh, to watch here are government bond yields, the spreads. Obviously, it's color-coded. The more red you are, the more in trouble you are. The five-year credit default swap spreads. Interest uh, expense as a percentage of GDP. Government debt as a percentage of GDP. Note, the USA is 130% uh, debt-to-GDP ratio. And if, this is the most important thing from this chart, and any time, that's why I'm fixated on things like debt and GDP and money printing and everything else. If the interest on debt as a percentage of GDP is greater than the GDP growth rate, it's game over. The debt cycle cannot be broken. It's that simple. Now, remember all those countries? Like, let me pop them up again, just to rattle off the top names. El Salvador, Ghana, Tunisia, Pakistan, Egypt, Kenya, Argentina, Ukraine, Bahrain, Namibia, Brazil. But look at this list. <laughs> these, these countries have worse debt-to-GDP ratios. Venezuela tops the charts, 350%. Japan, 266%. We've just seen the meltdown of the of the yen over the last six months as well. Sudan, 259. Greece, 206. And Europe is in there in a couple of places. Lebanon, 172%. Cabo Verde, 157. Italy, 156. Just picked, just lost number six place. Libya, Portugal, 134. Singapore, 131. Uh, I was surprised to see that, but I know they're investing heavy in the future. And Bahrain, 128% matched with United States of America at 128%, which is kind of stunning, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, if your debt cost grows faster than your GDP, it's game over. That is the case in the U.S. right now. There is no way. There's no way the U.S. can outgrow their debt. There's no way Italy can do it, too. There's no way Portugal can do it. So it's... It's a problem. It's what they call QE to infinity. The only way is to print more to get out. So anyway, speaking of that, though, one final thought for today that I just want to plant in your minds, ladies and gentlemen, and that is an interesting piece from the fourth industrial revolution from Cointelegraph. The source is Shaco. And I, I just, if you can see it, it's a bit of an eye chart, but you have the industrial revolution number one, which is kind of steam engineering, and then two was kind of the assembly line from 1930s with Ford and companies like that, and then three was computing and internet, maybe a little bit of nuclear thrown in there. And here we are at Industry 4.0. This is things like blockchains and cross-cutting technologies uh, like AI, cloud and data, big data, machine learning, biometrics, uh, you name it, these are all going to drive a huge amount of innovation like nothing we've ever seen before. Crypto, some people say, is like railways were to the world, but in today's world. And these are the top innovations that I believe emerging markets and Western nations need to embrace or die. This is where the future is going to be and not focusing on silly things that really don't matter or blocking innovation in this regard as well is a dangerous thing to do. So with that, everybody, hope you learned something good today and uh, I'll see you tomorrow for the live Q&A. Thank you all for being here and uh, we have some interesting questions tomorrow. I remember last week, yeah, all the questions were coalescing around one topic. This upcoming one is no different as well. Thanks all. Happy Saturday.